So I've got a potpourri of preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative pearls and pitfalls. And the first for a preoperative uh, pearl is using what I call a coloring book page. Uh, I'm happy to share this with anybody. It's something that I drew from a schematic and added the names, but happy to share it. And it's a sheet that all our patients get and I pull out my colored uh, fountain pens and I draw. And I actually like doing it. I realize this is a, it takes a little time, but it's kind of pen to paper, gives a break. Patients go home with a sheet. On the left is how I do a trapeziectomy, what's the procedure? And on the right is a de Quervain's tenosynovitis. And so it's just kind of fun to map it out and ask their questions as I draw. Um, I no longer write out abductor pollicis longus because you know the internet is much more reliable and they can look it up. So that's my pearl. My pitfall is not reviewing complex cases in advance of the procedure. And uh, I'm so blessed now to have a nurse practitioner who's made my life so much easier. And I also have to say with COVID, a lot of patients were seen much earlier than with their scheduled surgery. And nothing is more um, jarring than to come into an OR where you haven't reviewed a note or you've got staggered rooms and you've got multiple complex procedures. And cases in point, when you're doing multiple fingers, you know, we talked about multiple trigger fingers, a complex dupatrins where they may have um, multiple fingers that I'm doing and I may not address one nodule or whatever, to make sure that I reviewed it ahead of time. Uh, I take care of pediatric patients and the tendon transfers, it's, it's often a anatomic uh, free-for-all, but I certainly wanna know what's been discussed ahead of time. And last week I came back from vacation and I had a patient who had a PIP mass. She had Dupuytrens elsewhere. She had the snapping lateral bands that Dr. Schroeder talked about and had a fixed DIP contracture. And uh, for her, um, they were all interrelated, but not the same problem. So just reviewing the note and talking to her ahead of time was important. In this particular case that I'm showing here is someone that had multiple Dupuytren's procedures in the past, and we did a fifth ray amputation two weeks ago. And that's something you definitely want to make sure you reviewed your notes because you, um, you want to make sure you're taken off the finger for the right reason. Okay, moving on to interoperative pearl. Uh, absorbable sutures and glue have changed my postoperative life as a surgeon. Uh, started doing this about 15 years ago in the pediatric population and then extended to Dupuytren's patients. And I do this almost exclusively, there's a few exceptions. So volarly, I use a 5-0 plain gut. Here's Dermabond, here's someone at a week, and the wounds are really great. I mean, they're really awesome. Um, and the, uh, the Dermabond, I, I don't put on the three layers that how it was originally uh, described, but just do one layer. And, and if you have a small incision, sometimes just waiting for the glue to dry is like we say, watching paint dry. Dorsal wounds, I use a 4 running monocrole. I leave the ends out and I seal them with glue. And um, I've not had any dehiss with the exception of the elbow. The elbow for an inside 2 decompression, I will uh, leave them extra long and put in deeper sub-Q tissues. So the pitfall is the counter of that. So you never want to see this horrible Dupuytrens where I used uh, glue and absorbable stitches. It was sealed so tight that the patient had an extraordinary large hematoma, which required wet to dry dressings. So I no longer use absorbable stitches and glue in patients who are on any blood thinners. Uh, I don't use the absorbable sutures on mucus cysts that have macerated blisters. And of course, a, a known allergy. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times we don't know they have an allergy until afterwards. So here's a case of a person with uh, it was a cyst, it was not a decorvings, um, but had this uh, allergy to the dermabon. So postoperatively, um, next day phone call, this is Sally Field to remember for her Oscar speech. They like me, they really like me. Uh, so anyway, a calling to the patient the next day is just a game changer. I mean, we always talk to the patient or the family member after the surgery, but they never remember what you said. 
And the next day is just awesome because they feel important. They feel cared about. It's fresh in our mind and their mind. And you can pet, catch things uh, quite early. Uh, for instance, if pain is really severe or there's an issue with a block and definitely treated with genuine gratitude. And the pitfall, um, I now see Dupuytren's and implants at one week. Uh, and I find that's really important because you may miss folks. Uh, Bob mentioned CRPS. You want to catch it early. I now put uh, my Dupuytren's patients on gabapentin prophylactically for a week, just 300 milligrams at night. And then I want to see them at a week. And for any joint implants, particularly if there's any clinodactyly one way or another, um, I wanna get them on an early motion program. And if we need to do any alignment correction, uh, do it at a week where it's much easier than two weeks post-operatively. Post and of course, flexor tendons that you wanna do an early mobilization protocol, I wanna see them early. So that's it. And I will open it up to my colleagues if they have any questions specific to me, and then we'll wrap up the session. Amy, I'll jump in. I have a quick question and a comment. I, I love the dermabond technique with the absorbable sutures. And in fact, I credit you every time I use that because you had a correspondence newsletter tip about that probably eight or nine years ago, and I love it. But my question, that's my comment. My question is, do you use that in a wound like a carpal tunnel release where there might be more tension, so to speak, on the wound or um, uh, thoughts about when to not use that other than what you mentioned already? Thanks. Yeah, I always use it on carpal tunnel. Sometimes I'll use the monocryl running in a carpal tunnel incision. And early on, I did, I tied knots. I did all sorts of things thinking that the suture might uh, unravel. I've never seen it happen, again, with the exception of the in situ uh, at the elbow. So I no longer tie knots. I just make sure I seal the ends with glue. Um, I do put on a rather bulky dressing, which I take down at four or five days, uh, sometimes longer. But I do that really just to warn the patient not to do too much. So. Thanks. I had a quick question about um, return to work. Um, this is a big argument that goes on with a hand surgeons within our group. Uh, how quickly do you let your carpal tunnel release patients return to work? And whether it's back to with limited duty or full duty and how, to, how do you approach that with your patients? It depends on what they do. You know, most days, everybody working from home is doing relatively sedentary jobs. And I, I basically say they can type and do things they really need to within the within that week. As far as returning to physical activity, again, it depends. It depends if it's workers comp, it depends on its their livelihood. Uh, the fellow I mentioned the other day with the bilateral endoscopic owns a business and is a, a liquor distributor and he needs to go back to work. So that was the reason for doing it. So I'm sure he's gonna be driving a truck by Friday or tomorrow. <laughs> so, so how about you? Well, uh, there's some within our organization that say everybody can be back to full duty and um, work within two weeks of carpal tunnel release. And there's some of us who think it might take six weeks and there's some people who say it takes three months. But uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that again, it depends on their, their job duties and you can't make a blanket statement that every carpal tunnel release patient will be ready to go back full duty at two weeks. And then you have to give some people some leeway with some limited duty uh, you know, and especially the manual laborers. Um, so I, I don't, I don't have a blanket statement I give to patients, but some, some people I know do. So I had my carpal tunnel release. So 17 years ago or so endoscopically. And so as a patient and I'll, I'm pretty upfront with them, I'll tell them that anything that was twisty was annoying for about three weeks. Um, relief was immediate as far as symptoms. I had a little uh, um, FTP irritation of the ring finger, which I, you know, it's it was a sign to back off for doing things that were vigorous. Um, it took about three months, even with an endoscopic scar, to be not tender. And yeah. so those are real things. But fortunately, the overwhelming symptom of numbness and tingling is, you know, is, was gone. And it's those other things that we don't think about to tell our patients. Mm -hmm. Right. Nikki, any comments or questions? Yeah, I was sort of interested in your gabapentin protocol. 
Um, and if one week of gabapentin, I mean, usually I feel like when I start my patients on gabapentin, I do this slow titrate up telling them it takes at least one or two weeks to get to where I need them. And you'd mentioned just doing one week post-op. So I'm just interested in that protocol and you, what success you've seen with it. Yeah, one of my colleagues, Catherine Curtin, who's a plastic hand surgeon, is, is kind of a gabapentin guru. And she helped us come up with kind of a protocol. For Dupuytren's, we load 900 milligrams day of, and then 300 milligrams at night requires no taper and no um, cold turkey going off it. It's just a small enough dose. There are some folks that 100 milligrams for other conditions is probably enough, but 300 is really pretty safe. Um, most people with that small dose uh, enjoy good night's sleep without the fuzziness during the day. All righty. Well, I'd love to thank you all for an invigorating session and hope that everybody has a great rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. And see you next year.